Hey, how you guys doing? It's your boy Amari. I'm still here at PowerCon, and you must be wondering, what am I doing at this particular table? Well, I'm going to tell you all about it. It's a very special and a very important table. It's one of the creative, great creative forces from New York City. I'm talking about the one and only Bronx Heroes. And the gentleman that's sitting next to my left, he's not the star of the Bronx Heroes, but he's one of the stars of Bronx Heroes. I'm talking about the undeniable Tom Chiaka. How you doing, man? Hi, man. What's up, brother? Not much, man. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what's going on, man? What's going on is that I'm here at PowerCon. I'm here spending time with you, spending time at the Bronx Heroes table. Yes. This is amazing. Yes, and uh, we're here promoting the books. You know, we have our uh, book, the, the one that came out last year to uh, great acclaim, uh, Bronx Heroes in Trumpland, where our characters, Black Power and Astron, fought Trump. Uh, that's still available on, on Amazon. And uh, Walmart, twelve dollars. It's uh, right guess, over here. Guess what? We also have a hard copy of this gentleman too. That's right. And we have, this is the Bronx Heroes in, in Trump Land, which is still available. And then this is uh, the um, reprint edition of my first book, the Astro Comics with Astron Star Soldier, which originally came out in 1977. And the character Astron, uh, originally, I did that in Cardinal Hayes High School in the Bronx. 1969 with my good friend George Perez, the George Perez, and I penciled it and he inked it. Uh, and uh, it's the character Astron is an alien astronaut whose ship collides with an American astronaut in space. The two of them form one character. And uh, uh, later on, when I worked for DC Comics, I independently uh, published. The first issue of Astro Comics, um, and uh, I gave a copy of it to Jerry Conway, and he kind of borrowed some ideas for Firestorm, because it's some very similar things. So I consider Firestorm a homage, and kind of like the grandson of uh, of Astron. But that's another story. But uh, in any case, you know, we brought Astron back for Bronx Heroes in Trumpland, uh, and um, he's in it fighting Trump, Trumpy there. And then um, I am working with Tom Ahern, who you'll be seeing later. Uh, way later. Way later. Uh, over there. I uh, penciled and wrote the um, continuation of the story that I started in the first Astro Comics and then continued in Galaxia that I did with Rich Buckler in 81. And it's going to be a 150-page um, a graphic novel, which is a, the entire um, epic of Astron battling uh, the, uh, the evil forces that took over his planet, Zena, and uh, basically it's battle, battleground Earth, and these um, giant robots uh, decimate the planet. So he has a super team of characters that fight them at the end, uh, which includes some of the characters I created in high school, uh, Pars Veer, which I did with George Perez, and we have Lana of the Lost Land, who's in, who's in. So who is this mysterious woman called Lana of the Last Land? Lana of the Lost Land, right over here, is uh, a character that I created in 84 in Heroic Fantasy Magazine that was published by my friend uh, Marcus Boas, who's still painting today. And I penciled it, wrote it, and it was inked by my late friend Chris Peppo, who was a terrific artist. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2000, but he was very much uh, in like the Frazetta, Roy Krenkel um, mode as far as inking goes. It's okay. We're allowed to show nudity on my channel. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and um, so I, I, in this and in issue three, we had two stories. And then, you know, we stopped publication in the 80s. And then I, a couple of years ago, I decided, well, you know, let me continue the story because I have these, these stories already. Let's uh, see what happens. So I, I did a third chapter which uh, uh, Ray Felix is inking now and then I'm going to uh, finish it. I was originally thinking of doing a couple of issues but I think, no, I'm going to just do it as one graphic novel. So I'm going to do a fourth chapter and I'm going to have um, I'm going to lay it out and I'll probably have Ray and uh, my friend Tom Ahern here finish the inking to it and then we'll probably put it out on uh, Kickstarter or Amazon as same as uh, 
the Astron Star Soldier graphic novel, which will probably be on Amazon and Kickstarter, etc. And then uh, working on another book called Astron 1939, which I don't have any artwork from here, but it's uh, going to be another graphic novel as if Astron had come out in 1939. And uh, so uh, Tom O'Hearn has already inked a whole bunch of pages from that, and we have a bunch of fake covers. So it's kind of a fake history of Astron from like the 1940s, from the Golden Age up until the 70s. So we're going to do a bunch of different fake covers and a couple of stories. it will be kind of fun, you know, like an imaginary Everworld story of Astron if you, like, fighting the Nazis and fighting the, the KKK, stuff like that. So when, when I get to um, ink or draw a cover for you, let me know, man. Hey, listen, we'll talk later because I need, I need more stuff for Astron 1939. I'm working on that now. Okay, you heard what the man said. So what made you um, come up with a space opera or a space fantasy for a comic book? How, like, what's the, what's the inspiration behind it? Please tell us. Okay, actually it's pre-Star Wars. We're talking about the 60s. Basically, I was into uh, Mighty Adam, the, the original Japanese anime, Eight Man, and uh, uh, Astro Boy. I love Eight Man. Eight Man and Astro Boy created by Tezuka, who I met years ago in the 80s when he came to New York. But um, So I kind of like based Astron kind of on, uh, on those two characters. And then so when I created it in, in high school, you know, with George Perez, it was kind of like, you know, and also I, I was a little influenced by uh, the, revi the revival of Captain Marvel, not the Shazam, but the Captain Marvel by uh, Roy Thomas and Gil Kane. So, and that kind of space-faring stuff, you know, Jim Starlin doing stuff. So that's where that happened. And then uh, George Perez and I did a, a book called The Battalion, which um, you could probably find some pages on on uh, on uh, uh, Facebook or if you look it up on Google, but it was a comic book we did. Of course, back then we we didn't know how to print comic books at a printer, so we just basically just drew the comic book, and we drew it on paper. We bought it at Woolworths with flare pen and crayons, and we did a 22-page complete comic book called The Battalion. And it had all our heroes in it. So some of them I created, some of them George created. One of the characters George created was Power Girl, who looked a lot like the Power Girl that DC later did, who I think they borrowed the idea from George, because she had a white costume also. And then we had... Were her breasts as massively big as um, Power Girl's? No. And then uh, uh, she was more slim. And then we had another character called Nighthawk, who was a black character, and he was... a. Uh, uh, basically like, like a Batman type character. Um, we had Electron, and then we had Pars Veer, who was a half man, half uh, android, who I'm bringing back in the Astron graphic novel, but I'm making it a female now. You know, um, so we had that book, and the interesting thing about that was that, you know, it was a big hit at Cardinal Hayes High School because we passed the book around to everybody in the school to read. And then one day in an English class, one of the guys had it and was reading it, and the priest, who was the teacher, grabbed it and tore it in half and threw it in the garbage. That bastard. Yes. So after class, I retrieved it. And then I, at home, I taped it back together as best I could. And I had it for a few years. And later on, when I was working at Marvel with George, um, this was around the time of the 1976 Marvel Con that I was helping Stanley run. George was in the office, and I brought it. And I gave it back to George. So uh, a few years ago, George um, scanned it all and, and put it on Facebook, on his Facebook page. Unfortunately, he deleted the page. So, uh, and his account too. But what I, can, what I may do is uh, on my Facebook page, Tom, Thomas Siaka on Facebook, I will uh, uh, repost some of those pages. Also on the... Uh, George Perez uh, fan page they have a few a few pages from that also you could find it but it was kind of neat you know and I'm trying to talk George into letting us uh, reprint the book but he doesn't want to do it but 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 even back then he was like terrific it was almost like as good as he is now so 
But I brought him to his first Comic-Con in 1970 at the Statler Hilton, <coughs> New York Comic-Con, and that's where we, we started meeting some people who uh, were doing fanzines. And let me just show you guys. All right, we're going to see some of these amazing fanzines right now. Uh-oh, he got the goods. So in 1973, 1974, uh, I decided to do my own fanzine. And uh, so George did the front and back cover. He did one story called Casual Now. And then I did another one, which was like a Conan-type story. And, uh, you know, I printed 500 copies of this. And uh, uh, it sells for like $25, $30 on eBay now. The other, the other fanzine, which this is like the second story that, this is like the second story that George uh, did before becoming a pro. The first one was uh, in something called Factors Unknown, and that's going for like three hundred dollars on eBay now. But uh, this is a you know a very rare edition, but you can get it on eBay. Yeah, for the right price. For the right price, there are people selling it. Okay, okay. Um, so you have your book now. You did all this fanzine. What is what else is there for Thomas Shiaka to conquer? Well, like I said, I'm working on this uh, new graphic novel with uh, Tom Ahern, the Astronaut 39, and then later in the year, my cousin Robert Resto is uh, he's currently actually now directing a movie, actual feature film. Well, we're here for Thomas Shiaka. I'm gonna be involved in it because I, I helped write it. Okay, that's different then. Because I, because I, we, because we came up with the idea for it, um, Z Dead End, because I was going, we were driving to um, a film shoot. A friend of mine was doing a movie called Honor Among Men that starred Chuck Zito and Ed Asner and a bunch of other people, big names, and I had a small part in it. And Robert Clohesse from from uh, Blue Bloods, who's a friend of mine, uh, and Driving there, we're joking around and said, uh, what if we did a movie that was like a spoof of Plan 9 from Outer Space? And it had like, you know, UFOs and zombies and shit, you know, and, 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 and dead people coming back to life. And then he said, yeah, what if the UFOs were like flying? And then it was all the people that had gotten kidnapped and the, the aliens decided to dump them all. And started dumping them all over the world and the, the zombies are flying out of the... And, and all of a sudden, we said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then, and we had, and he actually wrote something. And a couple of years ago, we filmed a, uh, a teaser trailer. And we, f we filmed about 20 minutes of it. And then uh, the pandemic hit. But, uh, but in the meantime, uh, he started a Kickstarter. And he's actually has raised money. And he actually got some big name people. Tom Sizemore from Black Hawk Down. Uh, Kane Hodder. There's a whole bunch of other, George Lazenby, who was the second James Bond, is going to be in it. He's actually, he's actually a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, because I met him years ago when I, before I was, I, I actually worked on a couple of James Bond movies, Octopussy and The View to a Kill, because I actually wrote um, the original pre-title sequence for Octopussy. So I know George, and so when we out, went out to California a couple of years ago, to shoot this short for somebody, we went over and we went and had lunch with George. And he says, yeah, I'll do it, you know. Now George is at the, now is 80, he's like in his late 70s, and he's got like two 12-year-old kids. He's, he's in great shape. So we filmed like a couple of scenes with him, and like, and he became like best friends, because I introduced him to my cousin, and he's become like best friends with my cousin, so they talk every week. So he goes, yeah, when you guys are ready, come out, I'll shoot it. So he's going to play president of the United States. But we have, we have the ex-James Bond in there. But he's a great guy. And uh, he also loved uh, the Bronx Heroes in Trump land. Because so, his daughter wants to be a comic book artist. So, so I sent him some of our books. So uh, I know a lot of these guys. Um, I actually, when I was 21, I interview, interviewed Sean Connery on my birthday. So I had lunch with him. And I knew, and I knew Roger Moore when I worked on Octopussy, and also I was friends with the very first James Bond, Barry Nelson, who was on TV in the oh, 50s. Yeah. He played Jimmy Bond. Jimmy Bond, yes. I was friends with him because I was friends with his wife, who I knew from Star Trek conventions, because he 
married a much younger woman. So, so, so she, she says, oh yeah, you want to interview my husband? It's like, yeah, sure, Barry, oh yeah, you know. So, you know, I, I met him and I did an interview with him, which I have on, uh, on tape, which I'm, I'm going to put out eventually. It was supposed to be for a, a book that then never came out, but he was a very nice guy. So, you know, we went out to dinner and then later on we went to visit Patricia Neal at her apartment in, in, uh, on 57th Street. So, so I knew uh, pretty much like the first four James Bonds, you know, um, and uh, I've, been to, I've been to Pinewood Studios a few times and when I was at DC I actually worked at the first Superman movie and I, you know, I knew Chris Reeve, I became friends with him. Yeah, I didn't see you on the behind the scenes featurette. Um, Chris Reeve was a great guy. The first day he got the part, actually, we met him at DC. So, um, and it was like, ended up being late at night when we finally left the office. So I was going to visit friends down in the village and he was getting on the subway too because he had to go to an audition. So the two of us are on the subway and I said, Chris, why are you going on an audition? You just got the part for Superman. And he says, well, you know, Tom, you never know what happens. So I'm just going for the hell of it. I'm going to go do an audition for a commercial. And this is the guy who just got the part for Superman. But he says, you never know what happens. The thing could fall through, so. Yeah, that's, that was, that's very true because that was discussed on Behind the Featurette yeah. where, um, yeah, he got the role, but it doesn't mean that the movie's going to be um, made. Right, exactly. Because someone could just have a disagreement or something petty like, oh, Krypton should be colored blue instead of green. Right. So, you know, exactly. So, so he was a smart guy because, you know, it could fall through. So, but it didn't fall through and uh, you know, it became a big store. And he remained throughout his life a really nice guy. So he, didn't, he wasn't one of those guys that had a huge head. Because I know, because I had to go visit the set in England. And he said, hey, Tom, you know, when he, when he saw me, he had the costume on, but he had a, a white um, um, a, a, a bathrobe over him. But that was an experience because that, I, was, I was on the set at Pinewood. And Ned Beatty actually gave me a personal tour of all the sets and all the sound stages. Because oh, uh, I went there and then the, the producer, Ilya Sawkind, said, Hey, Ned, why don't you show Tom around? So he showed me around and we went to the Fortress of Solitude set on the, on the uh, James Bond stage. And then they had the, the, uh, the Luther's Lair. And we both were like on the exercise bikes there, you know. Uh, and then, you know, met Valerie Perrine and uh, Margot Kidder. Did you meet um, Gene Hackman? Yes. Yes. I was there when it was filming the scene where he was confronting Superman. You know, so. Um, and then, of course, I, I sat down with Richard Donner, who's from the Bronx, by the way. Of course. Donner's a, a city boy, New Yorker. Yeah. So Donner's from the Bronx, and he's from my old neighborhood around Pelham Parkway. So I got to talk to him about, you know, the old serials, because he was into all the old serials, Captain Marvel, Rocket Man. So he knew all about that stuff, and that's why he was perfect doing the Superman. And he even you know, used to knew about the Globe Theater on Pelham Parkway. So he, he saw all those things in, in the movie theaters there. And that's why the first two Superman movies are the best ones. Only because Richard Donner was on the production. Exactly. Exactly, because he knew exactly how to handle the character, which Richard Lester did not. So, how come the Sal Kinds um, let him go after Superman, a midway production of Superman 2? Well, what happened was that um, when I was there, they were shooting parts of Superman 2 because they had the. Um, Budget? No, no. They had the, uh, uh, the sets from uh, the second part there with the, um, the, the moon lander and stuff. Yeah. But what happened was that they were running behind in 78. So. They decided, well, we'll just finish shooting the first one, and then we'll come back. And so they shot about three quarters of the second one. And what happened was that Donner wanted to do a good job, and he didn't rush through things, and he, you know, kind of went over budget a little bit. So they got pissed off at him. So, so he kind of like got into a, a disagreement with them. So after the first movie came out, whatever, they decided, you know what, we're not going to hire him again, and we're just going to bring in Richard Lester to finish it. And Lester went and refilmed a lot of the stuff that, that Donner did so he could get his director credit. And they cut out a lot of stuff. And it took like 20 years or so, or 30 years. And they finally, in the 2006, the, 
Superman 2 Donner Cut came out, which restored all that footage, including a different ending, a different opening. Um, and, uh, 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 and it's really like a much better movie than the Superman 2 that came out. And that's it, as far as that goes. Okay. So, did you guys ever try to get Christopher Reed to like write some Superman comic books, or he kindly passed on the idea? No, no, that that was beyond. I, I mean, at that point, they, well, in the '80s when I was still work at DC, they weren't into that, um, and he was busy making movies or whatever. They didn't really get into like celebrities starting to write comic books until like the late '90s or the 2000s. Uh, when they got Richard Donner to write a Superman comic book, and I did the 2000, I think yeah, uh, him and Jeff Johns, I think, did did yeah. something. Um, so that that wouldn't have been, and then he, he really w wasn't into that. But he did uh, come up with the idea for Superman 4, which yes, unfortunately, yes, yes. which unfortunately, Canon Films screwed up because the movie actually runs. The original cut of the movie ran over almost two two and a quarter hours. And then Warner Brothers wanted to cut it to 90 minutes. So somewhere, Warner Brothers still has the long cut of it, which is a much better movie and makes sense. Yeah, because I saw that Bizarro makes a guest appearance. Right, that's the first... first uh, well, it's not really Bizarro, but it's kind of like Bizarro. It's the first Nuclear Man. So those cut scenes are on the DVD. But I have a page on Facebook called the Superman for Restoration page. So we're trying to get Warner Brothers to release the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Fury cut of, like the Snyderverse, Snyder cut, the original cut of um, Superman 4, which would be great because there's actually a soundtrack out from Entrada Records of Superman 4, the score, and it has all the music which was supposed to be for, you know, so it's like the full two and a half hours of music and uh, the music is by Alexander Courage, and there's some uh, new cuts that John Williams actually did do for the movie. Some of the themes for Nuclear Man and some of the themes for, for uh, the character, um, like some of the other characters. So, so, so it, it I got that will be a much better movie than what they released. So why didn't they use Bizarro? Why did they create Nuclear Man for the, comp for the movie? Um, I have no idea. I wasn't really involved with it at that time, but I was just saying that you know, they, they were just kind of trying to come up with a new character, and uh, the Nuclear Man, the first one, kind of resembled Bizarro, but I think they were trying to come up with a new character that was supposed to be like the anti-Superman, and that's what uh, Nuclear Man was supposed to be. Yeah, because when I saw that uncut, the original scene where Superman is fighting the so-called Bizarro, yeah. he had pale skin, right. a black high top, Right. And, you know, he was soft and mushy. Right. So that, that, I guess they, they, they took some ideas from Bizarro, but that was supposed to be like the first imperfect um, nuclear man, uh, which caught, sort of was like Bizarro, cause they took that because Luthor created him, like in the original comics, Luthor created the Bizarro. So they took some ideas from that. But that would have been good if they'd kept it in. And it was supposed to be kind of like a kind of a funny scene too. But... If you read the DC comic book, that has the complete story in the DC adaption of the movie. So all the cut scenes are there, including the scenes with uh, the kid. And at the end, Superman flies the kid around the world, much like um, that episode of, of the George Reeves Superman uh, TV show. So there's a lot of good stuff in there, which they, they cut out, and they just made a mess of it. Yep, that's show business for you. Exactly. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for educating the I, audience. I appreciate, it. I appreciate it, brother. You're a wonderful educator. Keep it up, thank man. You, man. And you're great, too. I, I, try, <laughs> I try my best. Right, right. Well, guys, thanks for watching. That's a wrap. Uh, until next time. Bye.